let's get rolling. So we have a bunch of uh, sponsors, of course, and I just want to acknowledge new sponsors. Swisscom, uh, who's right there, is uh, really interesting because they're not just a telco. They manage IT infrastructure for all of Switzerland and some other places. And uh, I found them to be a very a forward-looking company, particularly for uh, telco in terms of how they're organized, ability to use data resources, and interest in all the issues that you people are uh, interested in. Uh, the Liberty University of the Mediterranean, uh, uh, but people just call it LUM. So this is a uh, private university in the south of Italy, in Puglia, where the food is really, really good, <laughs> and the weather even better. And um, they have an innovation center that's funded by the government. And they'll be here. I don't know if they had too much baseball last night or something like that, probably. <laughs> um, and what we're doing is helping them uh, set up infrastructure, so data infrastructure, AI infrastructure, that helps all of the small businesses cooperate more agile, agilely and compete on the global stage. Uh, so it's interesting for that point of view. There's a lot of interesting industry there, but it's fragmented. Uh, uh, one of the interesting things about LUM, uh, which is that that part of Italy is the natural terminus for Belt and Road. And Italy was the first country in Europe to sign the agreement for Belt and Road, and it would be interesting to talk to them. Okay? Um, Ernst & Young, we have folks here. There we are. Okay. So, um, this is a, a local uh, laboratory, uh, part of uh, Global Reach, uh, that's interested in tax technology, compliance, things like that. And we're working with them to set up a laboratory here that'll be joint with MIT to be able to look at all these issues. And I like to say that you know we're sort of the horizon three, and they're sort of the horizon two for the people who have to operate on horizon one. Okay, is that fair, Jeff? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay good. See, uh, Fidelity, who I guess is not here today, uh, but they're a longtime partner. Obviously, they're interested in um, what these new technologies have to do with their business. They're sort of trying to sort of move into the new age. Uh, they give us resources for some of the data infrastructure for federated learning and AI. Uh, uh, in, in they give us resources in the sense of people and money to, to help do that, so they'll be lighter. IBM has been a great partner uh, starting last year, and we have uh, a lot of interesting things that are cooking with them. They're, of course, interested in blockchain, interested in AI, uh, the sort of notion of federated learning uh, to be able to concentrate data across lots of competitive uh, uh, businesses be able to get better insights, is I think perhaps the, the core thing to say. Uh, returning MasterCard, uh, who was more interested in blockchain and is now maybe more interested in AI and federated uh, data handling things. Um, Intuit will be here, but this is obviously a little too early for, for them. Um, uh, so they are, we're interested in blockchain, and we have the head of their blockchain systems that's a, a good friend and participant here. And although they don't like me to say it, um, they actually have put most of your tax records, if you're American citizens, on an internal blockchain. And the reason is, is to be able to concentrate different records in an immutable way and be able to resolve conflicts. And they're sort of looking to how you take that to the future, which is, which is interesting. It's not a distributed blockchain, but it's actually easy to make distributed. <laughs> so you might want to think about that. Uh, AFD is the French government, so they support us in uh, setting up pilots in uh, Senegal and Colombia. We have a lot of interesting relationships with Colombia. Impulsa is their innovation uh, part of the government. And so looking at digital identity, looking at public-private uh, concentration of data, looking particularly also at fairness in, in cash programs. Uh, so you'll hear a little bit about that uh, later. Uh, Accenture, you know what they do. This is everything. Um, and NRI, who's uh, a, a branch of Nomura, uh, which is, of course, a large financial trading uh, house in Japan. And they're particularly interested in 
many of the same things that the Italians are interested in. Small villages in Japan are not doing very well. How can you change the resources available to them to be able to uh, uh, help the economy, help the, the various uh, sorts of things that they try to do? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we anticipate having the Inter-American Development Bank uh, increase their funding to us. In particular, um, they're interested in tracking all of the refugees from Venezuela into Colombia, uh, which is something we did in Turkey with Syrian refugees, uh, as well as, hey, not too much baseball. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Our friends from, from Italy. Um, South Australia is uh, the premier of the country, uh, ran on a platform of having our group help them renovate South Australia uh, because it's declining population and GDP. And it's actually, in many ways, the same sort of problems that you see in Japan and in, uh, in, in southern Italy. You have these sort of traditional businesses, but they're sort of isolated. They're not engaged with the rest of the world. They're not coordinated with each other efficiently. So how do you do things? And, and solutions like digital identity, concentration of data, public-private data, to be able to do these sort of things and sort of have a better data-driven government than private policy uh, are the things that are in the, uh, the, the table. Um, Telefonica Alpha is particularly interested in, uh, so Telefonica, um, I, I sat with the board of directors for a while as a consultant uh, and helped them spin off this uh, infrastructure company which supports healthcare services. So they're interested in high value add healthcare services. Uh, they support, like Swisscom, they support the hospitals and other infrastructure for uh, some dozens of countries. Uh, so, that, you know, the, when the hospital does something, they do it on Telefonica hardware, maintained by Telefonica. So what can they do that's not commodity? And one of the things they can do is better AI across these silos. Right? Uh, BBVA, we've actually worked with them for a long time uh, in Turkey, where they have the brand name Guarantee, uh, and uh, now they're interested in extending that relationship, and you'll see a little bit of that. Uh, and then gifts from uh, Orbs and Endor. So those are blockchain startups uh, that did ICOs and are sort of friends of the family, and they helped us have the big party at, uh, at Davos and things like that. Um, Ors, which is, I don't know, I don't see Fabio here, but he's, he'll be here later. So he uh, runs a company in northern Italy that does management of supply chain uh, using AI techniques. Uh, Helios, which you've heard, uh, is revolutionizing the notion of data from liability to asset. Uh, you should talk to Faye, it's great. Um, Tencent gives us some money uh, to be able to uh, look at their data uh, to look at pro-social activity. So there are certain things that Tencent does uh, that are really sort of interesting. So how many of you people know what red packets are? Yeah, okay, so red packets are ways of gift giving. And it's a particular thing that they set up where, you know, people give money to a group of people and what you actually get is, is random. It's a little bit like you're giving people lottery tickets. Okay? Uh, so it's pro-social behavior. It's people sort of trying to build their social network and things like that. And I forget what the dollar value is, but the dollar value of these red packets is in the billions of dollars, right? I mean, in fact, they have certain days where billions of dollars of transactions happen. I don't know if you know the... Right. And, it, and, and during that, those holidays, it's, it's several billion dollars worth of gifts. I mean, it's really quite amazing. So one of our students is studying how do you actually make that uh, more efficient, more people doing it? How do you incent people to do things like that? And we also have a, a discussion with Ant Forrest. Uh, so Ant is, of course, the financial element uh, that, that underlies a lot of these things. It's actually the biggest 
financial, they like to call themselves the biggest financial transaction company in the world because they do some incredible number of transactions a day. Uh, it's bigger than the Visa network, for instance. Um, one of the things they do is that if you do a lot of pro-social things, they'll plant trees for you. And they've planted some three million trees, and the question is, is can they uh, do lots more trees, make people contribute lots more to the environment? And so this is an initiative through the United Nations uh, to sort of figure out how you make people contribute more to those sorts of things, and how you best motivate them. Oh, there we are, Hindu. Hi, Hindu. So he's from Intuit. He's the head of their blockchain systems. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Uh, Tulip is, is interesting. Tulip is one of the largest metal traders in the world. Um, and I don't know if you guys, do you guys know about metal? This is a great big bars of metal, right? So, so uh, it turns out that that's an industry that is, uh, while it's uh, probably hundreds of billions of dollars, is done like a cottage industry. So you have these big warehouses and you ship, you know, a hundred million dollars of metal there and they give you a piece of paper, and you have no real idea if the metal's there or not. And particularly if you have special high quality metal, you have no idea if you get that back. And there have been many instances of uh, fraud in the uh, nine and 10 digits, okay? So, so they're, they have an interest in, in setting up a company that uh, uses blockchain technology and IoT to make sure that your metal stays your metal and that you can see exactly where your metal is. And the amusing thing is, is that the technology that they're using is a, is a commercialization of what they use to track nuclear weapons, which is another thing you don't want to lose track of. Right? <laughs> so those are, there are good solutions for that. And Brevet, back here, yes, friend of the family. Uh, MIT alum is interested, as you heard, in all sorts of uh, government financing things. So you, let me see if I can get your business model correct, okay? So governments have a really hard time financing things because they have this very sort of 1800 sort of view of what you have to do. But if you sort of restructure the financing, uh, you can do it where the payments are much better, the interest rates are lower, blah, 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 blah. And that's what he does, sort of for, for large-scale infrastructure investment, right? Is that close enough? OK, good. <laughs> so so um, that's what we're doing. We have sister labs. This is something that Fabio, who's uh, uh, one of our Italian friends, put up. And this is the Davos event we held. You can see the Matterhorn sort of back here. Um, so in Asia, Hal, wherever Hal went, he ducked out for a minute, sort of runs this uh, laboratory that we have in Beijing, which um, is in the, 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 um, uh, the Beijing Normal University, which is one of the uh, five imperial universities. And uh, it's run by a person who used to be the mayor of uh, Beijing. And what it does is it gives us a way to ask what's happening in China uh, do things like this pro-social research uh, and stuff like that, and uh, as well as a conduit for, for some really bright students from places like Tsinghua, right? which you're, I guess, a, uh, a graduate of. So that's pretty cool. In Europe, we have a number of sort of partners in Turkey, in Italy, uh, in London, and um, some of those are supported by BBVA. Some of them are supported by the EU. Uh, just an interesting thing is one of the sort of things that came out of this is a student who now sits on the EU Competitive Commission. So that's the guys who like want to break up Google and things like that, right? And, and give out those billion dollar fines. So, so, if, so we have a sort of inside track there, I guess. And at Davos, I mentioned that the Tata family and the Forbes family and other people have supported our activities. We'll be doing that again in January. So that's a, it's a lot of fun. It's interesting, it's amazing people that show up there. Um, and so if you can, you can do it. Um, we have a lot of spin-offs that have happened. These are just sort of the most recent ones. So students uh, typically from, from this program 
about half the students go to fa uh, faculty positions and about half the students get involved with startups, okay? Um, some go to research labs, but that's actually a minority. Sorry <laughs> if you're looking to hire people. So Peter Kraft just took a position at Oxford. Um, Abdullah uh, took a position here in the business school. When Dong is at Oxford uh, two years ago, uh, Yves de Bonjoy is at Imperial, and he's the one that's on the EU Commission. Uh, he had, uh, took a position here at MIT, but then Max Planck stole him, so he's going to be, which is too bad, but he's going to be in, in Germany. Um, so those are some of the things that are going on there. Uh, one of my students is graduating. This is Alejandro Noriega. He's Mexican. Um, so he's developed with some of the other people technology for auditing uh, uh, social programs. Like, for instance, in Mexico and Brazil, there are something like 80 million people who get essentially means-tested cash payments. So if you're a young woman, your kids go to school, and you go for prenatal care, then the government will give you a check every week, okay? Um, but these programs are not terribly fair in the sense that they treat urban and rural people differently. They treat different ethnic groups uh, differently. And they haven't been able to, uh, and that's a political problem. So what he's developed is a divine design methodology that lets you look at these sorts of programs um, and tweak essentially the, the machine learning rules to be able to increase the fairness and the reach of the program without spending extra money. And the first two things are in Colombia and Costa Rica, uh, and Brazil and Mexico are lining up, and that's funded by the Inter-American Development Bank. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. You might want to know about that. We'll tell you about it. Um, we have another sort of spin-off. This is Annie. Uh, Kim, who uh, with some people from the AI lab here, uh, what used to be the AI lab, it's now CSAIL, um, set up a thing for data sharing in health. And you'll see da uh, Annie will, and her spinoff will be here. They're not going to speak this time, but they'll be here for the, uh, for the demos in the afternoon. So that's pretty interesting. This is a tough market to break into because everybody in the healthcare in the industry hates everybody else and they hold on to their data like death, right? So um, it's, uh, uh, but she's actually had some interesting uh, progress in that, so you might want to talk to her. Uh, Riff, there's Beth here. So um, it uh, came out of our um, online courses, and what we realized is that the material we were teaching was good, but even better was that we built connections between people because instead of having a lot of bad lecturers, well, we broke people into our small groups that worked together, and they chose who to work with, and they proposed their own ideas for exercises. And for instance, in the FinTech course we taught, which is mostly mid-career people uh, around the world, 15% uh, of the people who were online in the course ended up starting companies. If you know anything about accelerators and stuff, that's just mind-boggling. Um, and uh, one of the other things is that we could tell very early on who were going to be the leaders because their behavior was different and the way people reacted to them was different. Uh, so Canada is uh, using that technology to get all the small businesses in Canada to begin using AI. But subtext is to talk to each other and figure out what their problems are. That's actually probably the bigger effect, okay? and a precondition for actually using AI. The Air Force is interested because they spend enormous amounts of money figuring out who's going to be a good leader, and they're terrible at it, and they know they're terrible at it. <laughs> so this is a good format for, for them. Uh, and then Sela, is Alex Lipton here? Uh, sort of another friend of the family is a fellow here, and he uh, uh, just set up a narrow bank, which is a bank that doesn't make loans, it's uh, ideally it's fully backed by treasuries, um, but there's the carry on top of that, and you can make a, a, a decent bank that way. But more importantly, you can provide tokens that are genuinely stable because they're backed by the full faith and credit of the American government. And eventually, what you end up with something that's like special drawing rights from uh, the International Monetary Fund. So as you add other fiat currencies in there, and that's really interesting. 
okay? That, that sort of short circuits all those central bankers uh, in a way that is uh, uh, a personal sort of interest of mine, <laughs> okay? Um, so if you have questions about any of these, you know, the people will be here, they'll be around, you can sort of talk to them. Um, this is the bragging part of things, it's not the technical, but, but it sort of gives you the sense of, uh, uh, you know, what's, what's happening here and, and what we're doing with it. Um, so I'm personally sort of happy that the president of the EU invited me to keynote his opening uh, about a year ago to lecture all the ministers of the single digital market uh, about how they ought to handle data. So this morning at breakfast we were just talking about data localization and, uh, and that sort of stuff, right? How do you actually handle data when you've got GDPR and data localization laws? And then um, Eurostat invited me back to uh, uh, help them. So Eurostat is the official data resources for all of the EU. Uh, so I keynoted their thing. It was really amazing. We had an EU commissioner talking about secure multi-party computation. It was like, it was like oh my God, right? <laughs> like, I, I, you may not appreciate how, how, how somebody that uh, senior and a politician talking about a really technical thing. There's Alex Lipton. Yes, hi, hi. So he ran the quant uh, side of Bank of America for a long time and then just set up this narrow bank. And Kem Carey, who is a legal, legal uh, uh, master of the universe and was uh, chief counsel for Department of Commerce for 17 years. And briefly, Secretary of Commerce, acting, right? Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, about right. Anyhow, he knows where all the bodies are buried. Um, he, was <laughs> he was involved in negotiating uh, data transfer and compatibility with the EU and with China. And so you can ask him questions about things like that. This is a cartoon. Donnelly is a famous cartoonist that does things in the New York Times. Uh, not the Times, the uh, New Yorker? Which one? Which one? Yeah. New Yorker, right, so, so you recognize the style and this is, people say, oh look, it's a mad professor. Yes, okay. Um, we've had lots of visits from the White House, which is really interesting. Um, one of the interesting visits we had is the team that briefs the current president visited and wanted to know how they could communicate better with the current president. <laughs> so we, we talked about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, our book on data handling, uh, thanks to Hao, who translated here, uh, was republished by the Chinese government. It's the uh, Economic Science Press, right? Okay, so that's way cool. And then we have a, a new version, uh, a new book that sort of takes it further that's going to come out from MIT Press in the middle of the year. Um, we could give you preprints of that. Um, so this is something that sort of like snuck up on me. Uh, many years ago, I helped Nissan and Renault design their autonomous vehicle system. Uh, they had an institute here, which I was one of the directors. Um, and uh, this is sort of my baby. So we designed an architecture for autonomous vehicles. And it's level two, because we felt that the legal framework for supporting full autonomy was not going to be there for a long time. So you have to have a dual initiative. The humans and the machines are working together. And in fact, the sneaky thing is the machines train the humans, okay? Because the most interesting part of that system is the human. They're adaptable, they're smart, they also screw up a lot. So, so what you want is you want the machine to constantly and sort of quietly train the human. But what's interesting about this is this is an example of a distributed learning system. So it has a model of how people make decisions given this sort of sensor data around them. Uh, that's what's illustrated here. People use, this is a sort of a Gibsonian model where there's a potential field of obstacles and you try to minimize the risk based on this potential field. And what it does is reports back to a central facility um, the, the unexpected decisions that the humans make, okay? So it's showing the errors and the reason it does only that is that it uses cell phones to do this. And it's not even 5G or 4G, it's using 2G and, and 3G. 
uh, to be able to transmit this data. So it has to be very low bandwidth data, right? And so that's what they do. And this has been operating now for something like 10 years in Japan principally, but it's now standard on all Ultimas, which means it's the largest deployed level two autonomous system in the world. Okay. Um, I have a nice award. I wish they paid me, but that's okay. <laughs> um, they, they paid enough. And then uh, Nokia uh, gave me this award recently, which was sort of cool. Nokia is the other contender to Huawei for 5G in the world. And so they were very interested in what we're doing here also. Um, so what is the big idea? Um, so I'm going to go from sort of what's happened in the year to sort of the view that, that I have about where the world is going. And you guys are being quiet, and I understand that it's morning, but you can throw things. You can stand up and have outrage or whatever. Please, you know, make it more interesting um, for all of us, right? Um, so I think uh, those of us who have been around for a while uh, recognize the current situation as being sort of similar to when uh, the World Wide Web was deployed. Suddenly, things are different somehow, right? And it's spreading. And what's spreading is, of course, AI and blockchain and IoT, all of them together. It's not any one of them. It's this sort of synergy between these things of what's happening. And I think a way to look at it is the following, is, is that the internet gave us low-cost communications. Um, and what that meant was is that small companies in Seattle could suddenly have global reach for all sorts of things, for advertising, small companies in Silicon Valley. And that's the sort of place that we got this sort of current situation is these companies for essentially zero dollars, very, very low cost, could have fairly confident communications with everybody. And that's just had ramifications through all the industries. Right? So digitization, um, uh, you know, uh, the rise of these data companies, et cetera, et cetera. But notice that it's not 100% reliable, it's not accountable, and it's not secure in several ways. And so it doesn't support business processes very well. And in particular, it doesn't support automatic digital, uh, uh, business processes. So imagine that you wanted to do something complicated, like build a, a transportation system or a Boeing uh, 747 or something like that. You should be able to sort of like say, do it, and it would go out and sort of negotiate the, the financing and the delivery and the insurance contracts and the schedule, and it just comes back to you with, okay, you know, uh, Tuesday at three o'clock you get your airplane, right? Um, but we can't do that. Conceptually, we could, but the transactions are not reliable enough, they're not transparent enough, they're not accountable enough, there's all, the legal system doesn't recognize most of that stuff. You have to have paper, there's a bunch of things that are in the way of making that happen. But that's going away. So what's happening, I think, is that you can view this as um, the emergence of the ability to do reliable, trusted, accountable transactions for everything at essentially zero cost for most things. So for instance, one of the things you'll see that we have tonight is we have this effort with various law schools, because and I'm on the board of the uh, American Bar Association. So lawyers, as you know it, are going away, right? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> they're, they're, they're not so happy about this, OK? But actually, it's a great thing, because what happens is instead of like going through word by word and redlining things, lawyers turn into architects, business architects, where they're saying, here's the deal that you need to do. This is the way you do it. And all the details are done by computer. So they get to do much more interesting stuff, much more stuff, much more high value stuff. One of the shifts is they move from, no, you can't, to Here's the business plan. This is how to do it. This is actually very positive news for what are, in fact, very smart people who want to do well, right? But are are sort of bound down to the uh, 
uh, these, these very small details and doing things that, that are certainly beneath them in many ways. Um, and the things that make it possible are IoT. You know where that piece of metal is, right? You have a legally binding contract. There's some work to do on the legal side. Um, we're starting a publication, actually. Uh, it's called Computational Law. And uh, with Stanford, with some of the other uh, uh, law schools. And it's about this transformation. Because law schools really recognize that they have to train a generation that's on board with this. Uh, we had a hackathon, um, was it about a year ago, uh, for uh, digital rights, online digital rights. Uh, the hackathon was unique in that we had nine law schools on four continents that were participating and led it. Usually the hackathons, you know, building stuff, those are computer science guys, right? This is all lawyers doing this. That's a, I mean, think about that. That's like you have to sort of digest what that means for the future. Um, so anyway, so I think that's the thing that's happening. And then what we need to do here is we need to think about federated AI. So as you leave data where it is, you can't move data around. You have to be able to compute things across static data stores, right? So that's GDPR. It's data localization laws. Uh, it's also basic security. The more copies you make of something, the more chances you have of having it stolen. Uh, you have to have clear data ownership. So one of the things that I'm really happy about and is not widely recognized, but Faye, who was here, uh, I convinced him, uh, GDPR has enormous significance because it gives clear ownership rights to companies. It says, this stuff has control of individuals, and if it doesn't have control of individuals, the company owns it. Now, they don't emphasize that, right? Because it's a political document also. But that's what it says. So what that means is you can begin to monetize uh, and uh, do a whole variety of things, securitize this asset and Jeff back there points out, assets have to be taxed, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, so as you move into this, this suddenly, one of the things about GDPR is it provides this whole new class of genuine ownership for certain classes of data. And it's reliable. I mean, how can you trade things that you don't for certain own? Right? You can't, really. But if you give if the law, the Constitution in the EU gives you rights to things, and you can certainly set up a market around it, right? And for instance, in, in large-scale projects, that's really key, where you have to concentrate data from many, many, many people. Uh, just to sort of give an example, so that uh, at Davos, one of the things that was most interesting to me is we had a Belt and Road meeting. Uh, and it wasn't the Chinese that dominated that. It was everybody along the Belt and Road that dominated that. And one of the things that's characteristic of many of those governments is they're corrupt. <laughs> so nobody wants the government to lead it or underwrite it. They want to do it through sort of private means of some sort. So they were talking about building large-scale infrastructure using investment funds with 10 million LPs. How many LPs do you typically have? In a, I don't know. Or in, in if you got, many of you guys do large-scale investment. How many LPs do you typically have? No? Less than 10. A lot less than 10. <laughs> like, like typically 10, right? 100 is an extreme number. But if you think about, you know, say building a road, what about all the people who live along the road? Why wouldn't they be an LP? Right? Well, the reason is the overhead and the legal contractual elements of it and the certainty of it and so forth, right? But that's exactly what these tools are giving you, is the ability to create large-scale funds for investment where you can get people to do things. And the government has to say, yeah, it's, it's OK. But the government doesn't have to underwrite it. It doesn't have to be funded by taxes. Right? And, and the sort of computational things, the more data about people, about industry, about things, allows you to do much better risk analysis for a particular project than you were ever able to do before. So suddenly, it begins to make sense. And I'll show you a little bit about that. Okay. Um, is that striking to people? Yeah. Uh, just 
just so that the camera can hear you. My outside voice. Um, if you think about, Cindy, as you lay out the uh, limitations that the Internet has for uh, modern business transactions, and, and it's that perhaps as we see some of that shifting to a blockchain, how does that help facilitate companies' identification of their data assets, maybe facilitating getting it on the balance sheet, and then facilitating monetization of their data streams? Do you see that as the natural progression? Is this step one, phase one, and then how could that help facilitate actually monetizing the data assets that they have? So, um, <laughs> uh, so I'll give you my picture. If you want to get your ear really turned, uh, twisted, talk to Faye, um, but uh, who's, who's not here, unfortunately, but he'll be back. So the idea is this, is that if you have a really nicely organized data resource, you can identify what is individual personal data. You say, okay, that stuff is controlled by our, our customers, okay? However, aggregates of that that are not traceable back to any individual person are not subject to that sort of individual control. A way to think about that is, you know, you publish and are actually required to publish, for instance, the total revenue that you have, the total number of customers you have. Those are aggregates. Those are not owned by your customers. Right? So in same, as you sort of move in from the edge, there's personal data, there's stuff that's clearly a member a, a property of the company. And what GDPR does is it makes the ownership at the, at the leaves very clear, more clear, um, but it also makes ownership higher up, so aggregate things, for instance, more clear. And the rules for using individual data become clear, the sort of best practice for doing that, which is roughly the client has to understand it and positively assent to it, be able to monitor it, retract it, use it elsewhere. Right? So it's generally something that they have the, the the English common law rights of ownership. It's not technically ownership, but the rights of ownership. Um, so when you parse things up like that, then you say, well, these are my assets. Um, and I can now find ways to uh, you know, use them. And so the, the sort of thing that I think that you're beginning to see, and certain companies are beginning to do, is take those things and use them First, for social good, right? So, for instance, hey, folks, our friends from Italy, Italy who had too much baseball yesterday. <laughs> um, so, a, a typical thing is is uh, helping to help governments understand where transportation systems need to be, public health systems, things like that, things that are clear public goods and um, to establish the usefulness of this data in society and the fact that it's not dangerous. Okay? So this is something that I and some of my co-conspirators got written into the Sustainable Development Goals. And every uh, national statistical office in the world is supposed to begin using these sort of data resources, these private data resources, um, to be able to monitor their society. So what that's doing is, is that's saying, OK, this really is a, a, a common good asset class. And part of the common good is going to be in private hands, because it's collected by private hands. And of course, they have rights to, to use it in various ways. And then uh, aggregated, data aggregated data is the safe place to start. Yeah. OK? But I could imagine things, and, and, and I mean, I'll give you an example. Imagine that there was a data cooperative. So you had a, a, right? a lot of people put their data in there, and that acts as a fiduciary for the people. right? And what they do is they go to the hospital and say, why are you charging us for this when you don't even, you know? OK, because they can't tell what the hospital's doing. The hospital won't tell them. But if they could compare their medical records, they can figure out if they're getting what they need. Well, that's really interesting. OK? like a data broker type of thing for being able to, to get a better deal, uh, better services, things like that. So that's using individual level data with permission by a fiduciary. And that's like clearly a good thing by law and, and sort of politically. 
at the other end, you have this sort of uh, aggregate data, you know, like by, for instance, census block in this country. And, you know, that's been long established to be something that's relatively safe. Uh, people understand it. You can make maps of it. So, oh, okay, yeah. Right? So there, you get this sort of immediate public okay, right, as opposed to you're spying on me and using my data, right? Um, so, and that, that's actually a political statement more than, I mean, there are technical things underneath it that support it, but it, to some degree, this is a public acceptance and also informed consent, because now people can see it and understand it, so you can make propositions that they genuinely understand. Okay, so all, sorry, a long way of answering the question, but it's an important question. So you have a couple of avenues for beginning to aggregate this stuff for uh, effect that can be both public and uh, for, for private benefit. And it can be done by for-profit or not-for-profit or government. Um, and that's sort of what's happening. And I think the examples of the sort of hospital thing, labor, like we've talked to labor unions, labor unions like the idea of all the Uber drivers knowing how they're being paid. Because they don't know how they're getting paid now, right? So you could have a data union for Uber drivers, and they could uh, demand, you know, they could tell what's happening, first of all, and then they could demand uh, a, a different deal. Like if every, every Uber driver in Boston signed on, Uber would have to list them. This uh, musings about uh, dramatically new economy and so on and so forth, Uber in reality is uh, kind of engaged in exploitation to the nth degree, so it's bringing back to the 18th century more than that. And what I hear now is that uh, they essentially show different uh, prices to the drivers and to the passengers. So kind of the idea originally was like the uh, Uber takes 15% and blah, 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 but reality is that you know, it takes 15% plus everything they can get on top. So how would this, what you're saying, I, I think is uh, super interesting from that perspective. Yeah, so imagine that you took the MIT, so this is not fantasy, okay? Um, imagine that the MIT uh, credit union, which is a federally chartered credit union, and is legally able to represent your data for you as a fiduciary, uh, said, all the people who use Uber, tell me what you paid, because that's in your credit card records, right? And all the people who drive for Uber, tell us what you got paid. And you could begin matching them up along sensitive attributes. Now, you might not be able to do one-on-one -on -one pairing. This guy paid for that ride. But you could do um, uh, sort of aggregate pairings. You could say, huh. How come the guys in this region get paid less than the guys in that region when the customer spend is the same? Huh, must be some sort of thing going on there. Okay? Super interesting. Yeah, that's super interesting, right? <laughs> yeah. There's a, another pattern that we're using uh, for our medical research as we're trying to do more wellness research. We need very detailed data at an individual level about their medical and behavioral history from cradle to grave. We're able to get that while maintaining the anonymity of the person. So you have a, almost a safe harbor kind of mechanism where a third party aggregates all the data in a way so that no one gets to see anyone else's data in an identified way, but they can see everything in a non-identified way. And so it's not aggregated, it's individualized. I don't think the mechanisms we have for that right now are ideal, but that's, that's another kind of a use case pattern that's very interesting to us. Yeah, so anonymization is typical in medical industry, and it's deeply suspicious. So regulators in general are not, are, are waking up to the fact that you can re-identify things right. very easily. That's the risk. Right? And so then what do you do about that? And so uh, in general, we don't recommend that people use that sort of data uh, that you immediately aggregate it in some way. So for instance, your provider may have a, a, some sort of legal responsibility to the originer of the data, but what they should be providing with you is uh, statistics about various categories, and then you're completely safe. Uh, it limits what you can see, 
Okay, but that in some sense that's the point, right? You can't re-identify somebody with other data that you have, like you might have a claim data, and then you go and say, "Oh, look, it's that guy, right?" You know, and we see that he did X, Y, and Z, and so we're going to disallow his claim. So, so, so you can re-identify things like that way, and you can imagine in court that would, you know, who would who would lose in that sort of thing. Um, so this aggregation thing, there's other sort of techniques that people use. There's other ways of doing what you do without actually looking at the data, which is interesting. But this general thing of, of assets and securitization, you know, relies on identifying what do you have rights over and what do you not have rights over, and then finding a way that you have a sort of socially responsible way to be able to, to claim that. So. Um, the example I gave about the Uber drivers, um, that's something where people would know exactly what's happening. And the holder of the data in a case like that, right, is somebody who has a fiduciary responsibility to the people, is owned by the members, right? So it's not a third party, it's them, right, in this aggregate sense, right? And that's a much safer ground uh, for all sorts of legal things. Also, let me just, this is one other thing, which is, is that, you know, we had this problem about a century ago. You had these mega corporations, U.S. Steel, Standard Oil. They were exploiting people, labor. They were exploiting them financially. Uh, and that's where we got labor unions <laughs> and where we got credit unions, right? That's why that legislation all dates to the early 1900s, right? And so you can imagine a similar thing today with this new asset that's like labor, like cash, that it has an individual ownership, but it's only valuable in aggregate, right? Okay. Rajni, yeah. Who, um, you should introduce yourself, because people ought to know that you, oh, okay. you speak so, with authority, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, Dr. Rajni and Asia, I'm the head of digital transformation for Sanofi. It stays in Novartis, that was my old company, so we'll make the change. Um, and I'm also on the board of Connection Science, so I'm a Connection Science Fellow. But I'm building on uh, what the gentleman said before. One of the trends that recently I'm seeing in healthcare, or I think it's actually for finance or other industry too, is does the individual contributor get paid and compensated for contributing their data? There's a company out of New York, um, hum Humanity.io, mm -hmm. Um, and they are actually really accelerating this idea. It's very difficult to, um, I would say, socialize this in a, in a healthcare setting. But again, we're using individual's data for medical research, for advancement in science, but we're never paying patients directly or compensating for utilizing what, what data we're using for, for this. So have you, do you have any comments or have you seen yeah, anything yeah. happening? So, um I'm not a fan of paying people directly because the actual sort of cash value is not all that high. You know, like just take the medical thing. Is it, so you're going to pay me, you know, 50 bucks or 100 bucks. It's like I'm not going to get really excited. On the other hand, if we can use aggregate data to get better healthcare services that are appropriate for the community, then my kid might not die. <laughs> Sign me up, right? <laughs> Any amount of money is, you know, right? So you can imagine, for instance, that there are, uh, so you could pay people for that. I think people would be a lot more. No, I know, but, but I think that, that you can imagine perhaps um, better, and you're seeing some of this, okay, is that you have a, a citizen organization that collects the citizen's data and uses it, uh, essentially securitizes it gives it to the different sort of medical things. So you, you don't, as a citizen, I can't bet on you as good as you are. I have to also bet on the Vardis, on everybody else, on you guys. And so what I want is I want a collective, because my data alone is not worth very much. So I want a collective where I can say, this is the gold standard data set. And what we'll do is we'll help you with drug discovery, but we want a percentage. And, and you can imagine establishing that as a, a deal. Um, part of the, come on in. Sorry. No. You have to introduce yourself a little bit, too. Bob, 
how do you say your last name? Posen? Posen, right. So uh, ran Fidelity from when it was small to when it was big. And what was it you did with taxes? What is it, well, how were you involved with taxes? Okay. <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah. Pay attention to him. <laughs> okay, so thank you for coming. Um, so we're talking about data securitization and stuff like that at this point. So, so the, um, I think going back to a century ago is probably a good way to think about it. Is, is that there were these collective actions, is these things that represented people as a collective um, to be able to uh, get better services. So for instance, it's those unions and things like that that eventually ended up with things like social security. I mean, they were very important in advocating for that. The, the labor laws came from their actions. These weren't cash payments directly, these were collective action based on um, what they had for evidence at the time, right? So you can imagine citizen groups advocating for uh, better uh, uh, policy for government, but based on data, not just what they feel, right? And, and that's what you see, what I see in governments. Governments are realizing that they don't know what's happening in their community, they run on heuristics. And the whole point of the sustainable development data part that I'm on the board of is that that's not acceptable anymore. You actually have to collect data, which is mostly private data, to show that your policy addresses the right thing. And I mentioned this cash transfer program thing that Alejandro's doing. So essentially, it's that. It's that they've been running, <laughs> they had a really interesting meeting where the head of the Colombian government uh, uh, legislature was there, and he got up and said, we spent 9% of our GDP on cash transfers, and we measured the effect, and the effect was zero to two significant digits. So they're wasting 9% because of, of capture, right? <coughs> and so they're very interested in data-driven ways to qualify benefits, programs, things like that. So, you know, that's the territory that's out there. I'm, I'm not real enthusiastic about the future of sort of direct payments types of things, because then I can't use my data for other things. It's not worth that much. I like the idea of, of this sort of investment funds, where, so one of the things about, um, you know, doing large-scale infrastructure is you have to know who's going to use the infrastructure and what they're willing to pay for it. So if I can get most of the people that are going to use it to cough up money, right, they can also share data, which means I can do much better at monitoring the effects of it and dynamic pricing and all sorts of junk like that. Uh, Irving? Uh, Sandy, I don't know if you were going to mention this point later, but one of the things that has been coming out of your group that I think is a very big idea is the notion of complementing data analysis with models of what it is you're looking for. Now, for anybody who's been involved in science, the fact that you need models is like, yeah, of course, that's what the scientific method has been about, we wouldn't have found the Higgs boson with just analyzing a lot of data or extra galactic planets. But in the last decade, I think there's been a view that uh, machine learning, deep learning, big data on its own is good enough for predictions. And then, of course, you come along and write social physics and say, you know, Models still are important, so can you talk about the work that's going on on using models to make predictions about people and organizations and societies? Um, yeah, I can, but I notice we're already running late, and I better stop. This is really interesting to me. I hope it's interesting to you. Um, we can come back to this, but let's um, let's you know, sort of deal with that and then get on to the models, okay? So, so one of the views here 
is that everyone's excited about AI, deep learning sort of stuff, but it has great limitations. It requires enormous amount of data. It requires a static situation. It doesn't handle dynamic things. Um, it has uh, fragility in ways that are unexpected. There's a lot of hilarious examples of things that these things think are faces that really aren't, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the way you solve that sort of thing is you build knowledge about the domain into the learning mechanisms. So these are the models that help you interpret the data, and then you do the AI to sort of you know, optimize the parameters and so forth. And that sort of machine learning, that sort of AI, can be enormously more efficient. It can handle changing situations better. It can be much more robust. And so a lot of that is what we're doing here, and that's what you're going to hear next. Um, let me like not answer questions so that Yan can get up here, and we can sort of stay more or less on schedule, but I'm around. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of the, refuge, uh, the things we have. Um, we're, I mentioned that we did all of the refugees in Syria to look at integration. Uh, we're also uh, beginning to do Colombia. Uh, so that's the Venezuelans in Colombia. Interesting example, open music. So we have a partnership with the School of Music, uh, Berkeley, which has some 600,000 uh, pieces of music. Most of the famous musicians, modern musicians, come from Berkeley. They're all part of this, and the idea is to give digital rights using a blockchain sort of mechanism to all these pieces of music, and there's a number of large record companies that are signed up, and uh, Tencent actually wants to contribute a very substantial amount of money uh, to enable uh, music markets in China. Um, so we're going to be partnering with them. And something we just put on the web, which is uh, Atlas of Inequality, uh, and the idea there is that you can use the sort of data that's available, uh, aggregate data, to look at people's behavior and how much individual behavior, individual local behavior, contributes to polarization and inequality. So what happens is you're standing on the street and you want to get something to eat, and there's this restaurant and that restaurant, and they're about the same price, right? And you'll go to this one because it has people like you in you. You won't go to the other one. Turns out that in America, that's about 50% of all the segregation. So we, we uh, talk about, in terms of your exposure to other people, OK? So we talk about, you know, oh, there's this, you know, this poor area. Nobody goes there. All the people of this ethnic thing live over there. So that's the static version, but the dynamic version is just as important, just as big an effect, and it's something that you can begin uh, making a little dashboard for. So for instance, I could say, food near me, right? And it could build in some of these externalities to encourage greater interaction uh, between different groups. Or uh, we're just talking to uh, the head of mobility for Deloitte, uh, who is interested in something like that so that you can look at all of the externalities for those choices. Do you take Uber? Do you take the, do you walk? Do you take the T? How does it result in better utilization of the city resources? What does it contribute to segregation? All of that could be built in your recommendation engine. Today, recommendation engines uh, uh, reinforce segregation, reinforce, um, carbon bad things, reinforce things that end up uh, having uh, bad uh, social effects. Just the way the echo chambers in, in Facebook are, the same is true for mobility, food recommendations, stuff like that. And that's at least as much a problem as Facebook, but nobody talks about it. You need to be able to aggregate individual data to represent the interests of the individual, right? So credit unions, other sorts of services where they hold individual level data and then they request, they share data for uh, requests in a fiduciary way where they represent it. And that's very consistent with a sort of philosophy of GDPR. It also allows you to be data, uh, 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 data localization respecting and also allows you to do things uh, across different organizations. 
So it's a, it's a sort of full federated thing where uh, you avoid the sort of powerlessness of the individual uh, because they get to aggregate things to ask questions that are of their interest. And I think that's actually the way you're going to see things go. I don't know if the data aggregators and fiduciary are going to be for profit or not for profit. We're talking with credit unions, for instance, labor unions. But clearly small banks, big banks could be doing this also, and other entities could be doing this as well. Uh, the, the key thing is, is that it's something where the individuals understand what's happening. They have the ability to aggregate and act as a legal representative of the individual. So that's sort of the, you know, getting the oil out of the ground for the new economy. Cam. <laughs> he doesn't need it. <laughs> how does Alice know how to set her access rules? So, so if yes. she sets the access rules, how yes. is is the cooperative acting as the legal representative yes. as opposed to you know, simply executing? Yes. Right. So, so this would be a user interface design. So this is this is whole discussion about remember Facebook's setting the privacy thing, that, that there was a whole discussion on that. So it would need to be, so the, 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 the blanket explanation is that we are running an algorithm on your data. Your data is not going anywhere. We're not selling your data. That needs to be point number one. Point number two that you, you need to, the, the access is, a, is binary, yes, no, on the data type because the data store might have GPS data, it might have you know, blood type data, right? So this is all, this is all, you know, the user would need to, you know, pull that, was it the, the slider, you know, yes, 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 yes. But it needs to be clear to the member that, that this is not moving data, this is running an algorithm. And it's so hard to explain this to people. I've tried, I keep trying. So, so my answer is a little bit different. So my answer is the following, is it's like when I go into a bank uh, or Fidelity, they say, okay, here's a series of options that you can have for investing your money, and we're willing to tell you about the risk profile of all of them, and uh, we're audited so that we're doing what we're telling you, and there's a sort of broad societal agreement that those are honest and fair options for individuals. So choice is maintained, but it's choice of among some things that are good for you, and so you know, it's the same thing if I go see a lawyer or hire a doctor. They have certain choices that they will recommend. They'll try to explain it to me. And they have a responsibility to act in my best interest. Okay, so I don't like the sort of granular thing. Yes, where You agreed. do this, you do that. You know, I like something where you say, look, among the sort of the, the data governance committee of our uh, cooperative, which is a representative of you, you own this, Right? It's people from the community. We feel that there are five different settings you could pick right. from, you know, sort of most out there to most conservative. And these are the sorts of consequences you have for choosing this. So that's the informed consent thing. And the fiduciary is picking things, because it's like way complicated. Yeah. Right? It's like, no, no normal human being. I'm not, <laughs> you're not, you're not going to move I'm, sliders. Okay. I have no idea, right? You know? And, I'm, and I study this stuff, so I should, you know, okay. So there has to be something where it's somebody who, who spends full time on it, really understands, recommends certain best practice that I'm sure the government will take a look at that, right? Um, but that's the sort of portfolio that I would be offered. And in that case, um, I think that's, that's what I mean when I say fiduciary, right? They're really, and, and it's a sort of cooperative fiduciary. So it's not my individual, I mean, I make individual choices about which co-op to go to, for instance, and I make, make choices among the different options that they offer, but I don't have to worry about all the details. And that's just the way we have it in the financial system. Yeah. I don't know what the bank does with my money. You know, it seems to work. Government vouches for it. They insure against it. Okay, you know, it's what everybody does. That's sort of the way it really works, right? Um, but you just have to make sure those options are reasonable options for people. And it won't be perfect. We have financial meltdowns, right? 
so we try really hard, but it doesn't always work. <laughs> Same thing with data. There will be disasters, but we're going to do the best we can as we go forward, just like we try to do with, with, uh, with money. I also think that, that you know, one of the discussions people always have is, well, can I ask these people to sell my data and give me money? And I mm. think that that's a poor answer mm. because currently most people are not worth very much. Um, however, in terms of data, <laughs> however, if you talk about getting a fair shake in employment or getting the medical services you need, that's worth everything. So, so, so that sort of societal negotiation, and this is why we created credit unions back in the early 1900s, why we created labor unions, is because you need that collective bargaining to be able to get a fair shake. It's not the monetary thing. It's, it's, the, it's the political discussion at the end of the day that causes things to happen. Yeah, I, I think uh, I read your paper, and I think uh, it's a great idea of data um, uh, <coughs> cooperatives, but I think the idea of attaching it to labor unions is really a bad idea. A lot, most credit unions are credit unions for the employees, including right. all employees, not labor unions. If it gets attached to labor unions, I think you'll... It, no, it's two, two different groups of people, yeah. Yeah, well, you, uh, labor yeah. unions can just be one. That's the right. MIT's credit union has very little yeah. to do with labor unions. Yeah. No, actually, we, we're going for the credit unions because yeah. they already have IT infrastructure, so... Yeah, we, no, I understand. They have, they have but in this at, paper... At a certain level, you know, so, for instance, we... We presented this idea at Davos, okay, and um, as a way of uh, politically testing the idea, if you could get endorsement by labor unions, that meant that you were likely to be received well in a lot of different countries than if you just talk about banks. Well, data. but if you think about, I don't know if you've been involved with a labor union negotiation, but the type of data that labor unions need is a lot of it has to do with profitability of the company and lots of things that don't really Correct. relate to the data that you're talking about. So it's actually not a very good model. And that leads me this, to the question I have is, I'm trying to think other than Uber drivers, which I can understand, um, what, what actual, you know, what situations are you gonna use the data from people I assume, are we talking about the data from Google, the data from Facebook? No, uh, what are we talking so about? So personally, the, the easy ones would be GPS data because everybody carries these devices and it's always generating GPS data. So then then, then the question is, what, would you use that to well, so in with whom? Well, so the, the say take the MIT Credit Union, you know, it could run analytics just on, say, on, let's say you have a bunch of students who join, not just oh. students, you could say, well, you know, our members are not exercising enough on campus. How do we know that? Well, we have the GPS data and the average person walks, you know, 0 0.1 mile a week. Yeah, so right. even that's actionable. So at least, you know, you can reach out and educate them and they get benefit out of it. I could see how you could use it to sell it to companies for advertising and for these sorts of things. But actually, I'm, all I'm pointing out is labor unions are really Okay, so we'll take Not labor a good idea, but we'll, we'll take, take labor unions out. Okay. But, we'll labor but I think we should try to come list. up with, I like, use cases, I mean, yeah. for instance, use cases. So I could see GPS data being used and cell phone data for a company, say, like Procter & Gamble that wanted to sell consumer goods and, you know, or... Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's clear that, that that is a source, but um, the the in all the sort of discussions I have, the things that really resonate with people are things like safety of your children. Yeah. Screw the money. I want my kid to live. Okay? So, no, I'm serious. Like, no, that's no, the discussion. That. So, so then and and, and that means that the hospitals that. have to be audited. And currently, hospitals, we have no idea what treatments they use, how well they work, how appropriate they are to the community. And, and the healthcare system is sufficiently fragmented and, and frustrated that, you know, by the time your kids grow, grow up, maybe. But, but it isn't going to happen anytime short. 
It requires sort of consensual action to be able to do it. Or as you heard about the uh, segregation, the visible segregation that is done in, in the sort of traditional way is really only half or less of the problem. The reason that matters in many cases is that it's not just segregation like we think of in this country that has to do with race mostly. You can look at that segregation and that directly predicts growth in GDP. Directly, right? It accounts for half of the variance. It's more important than education. It's more important than uh, uh, policies, typically. It's more important than almost all the things we focus on is this business of being able to mix with people who have different perspectives and offer different possibilities and different role models to learn from. And we could have a long discussion about that. But, but if you're going to design a city or city infrastructure uh, and you're going to address poverty, for instance, in any sort of systematic way, you have to do the network of interactions, not just where people live. That's actually the sort of meta story there. There was a wonderful paper. I'm sorry to go on about that. I just want to make sure it doesn't sound like a lunatic. <clears throat> there was a, a nice example, I think it was in the Times recently. You know, at the end of the Civil War, all the slaves were freed, which means there was a whole class of people that suddenly became impoverished, that used to be rich. And within a generation, they were back at the same level that they were, but without the slaves. And the reason was is they were part of this network of well-to-do landowners, and they had the opportunity and the trust of the other people within that class to find other opportunities. At the same time, a bunch of people that were sort of middle class, white, in the South, didn't change their income much at all because they didn't have the opportunity to do that. Right? They, they didn't have the trust of the people that I'm held the resources. To this data cooperative. Um, because you can't tell about things like access to opportunity without being I mean, able to have the data. I'm not sure that people are going to be donating or being giving their that sort of data. They're not giving they're the data. They're it. not giving data. They're not giving data. They own the data. Their data is being held and they're by them by a fiduciary, just like your money. And then they, as a community, get to ask questions. Right? So, sorry. I mean, you know, <laughs> probably shouldn't spend a lot of time on it because it's a deep and complicated. We, we can talk tonight. This, we can this talk alcohol. tonight. We have a glass of <laughs> wine or beer or something like that. Yeah. Sandy, uh, two questions. I mean, I'll, I'll use this opportunity. First of all, I read this very interesting article in the Times indeed. One question which I had about that, which was slightly mysterious, because they said that, you know, this young man became rich again in a generation and so on because they were marrying rich women. But in a sense, in this sort of stratum, right, everybody would have to be impoverished because the women would be you know, heresies to uh, estates without uh, labor force, right? So that, that was a big question mark for me, and it's a very strange explanation. But, I mean, that we can discuss, obviously, separately. But the, regarding this very brilliant idea you have, I have one question. I mean, I have always been sort of very, uh, you know, kind of concerned about the fact that once a person... Uh, social security number gets revealed on kind of dark web or whatnot, it's there for good, right? So when they advertise on TV that we're monitoring your kind of, <laughs> you know, social security number on the web, I mean, it, it's just completely pointless, right? So it's like uh, in this uh, Robin Hood man in tights when he, Robin Hood tells his sidekick, <laughs> watch my back, and he says he kicked you twice, right? So the same thing here. So is your setup capable of obviating this somehow by providing, say, some zero knowledge information about this super sensitive data which once released cannot be recovered? Well, that's the general sort of framework is, is that the only sorts of things yes. that get answered out of this are things that are not reverse engineerable. Yeah. So you could put the zero knowledge protocol on the left hand side. The so, so, yes. the, you know, so the, it's, a, it's important to look at this as a dynamic process. So you say, what would get people to actually do this today how would they see value immediately? And then separately, 
how can that evolve towards the best of all possible worlds? Okay, so if I say to people, you're already a member of the credit union, click here, and what happens is the credit union will hold data for you and answer questions that your community has. Okay? Uh, social security numbers are just stupid. It's an identifier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just, you know, you're right. It's like, what, what, what were these bozos thinking, right? You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, I mean, you know, it's not that the number is stupid. It's that using it as an identifier is completely like a, a broken idea. Um, it just shows that, that organizations are lazy, right? So, so um, and we have a whole thing about, you know, zero knowledge proofs and ways of uh, doing identity authentication. And incidentally, it's not just back then that they were stupid. So, for instance, India's Adahar is wonderful in many ways, but it allows stealing biometrics. It's like, oh, my God, <laughs> what were you thinking, right? From the whole country, right? From the whole country, that's right, yeah. Yeah. You know, as a, as a telco provider, we are trying to do that, actually. And, uh, you, of course, depending on the regulation, uh, back home we have, uh, uh, we have to opt out, actually, all data, uh, how do you say, all data sharing options, actually, as a provider. And the question which always comes up, actually, from Alice, <laughs> if you want, so why I should do it? Uh, what is, how I profit? Uh, do you have an answer on that? Because the system, of course, is great. I'm not so sure uh, if the banks are actually the right uh, uh, the right one running the co the consent server. I think it needs just a company of highest trust. If there yeah, are the banks, it's a company or, uh, of high trust. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe the banks are not not in the best position, not everywhere to do that. But uh, the big question always for me is uh, the answer to Alice why I should participate. So, so what do you would tell them? I mean, if so the bank, the banks are, are just sort of a, a, a riff on the fact that um, in many countries, um, credit unions are cooperative, so they're owned by the people. Um, it's uh, they're sort of hopeless in terms of their business model, uh, and so they're looking for new things to do. They're community determined. It turns out there's very few data provi software providers for them, so you only have to sell this idea to one person to get, for instance, in the United States, to get, say, 50, 60 million people offered something like this. That sounds like something we could do. Um, in fact, we'll see that person next tomorrow. Um, and that, But you're right. It's any organization which has sufficient trust. So you guys, you're trusted, right? Um, the co-op in Switzerland could be trusted. It's owned by the people. It's, it's really sort of this political calculus. So questions people ask is who owns the data? Well, you own the data if it's a co-op, right? Uh, are there going to be sensitive data released? Well, no, we're not going to do that uh, unless everybody agrees that that's the thing to do, right? So it's cooperative governance. Okay, that answers another set of questions. Um, you know. At some level, I don't care. I'm trying to find a way forward uh, to be able to do this. Okay, and then so what are the ways you make money right offhand? Well, so one of the first things is identity theft, right? It's a robust authentication for your identity. Um, so there's a lot of sort of obvious positive thing there. A second thing is um, vari variations in needs for community. So, for instance, uh, when we looked at young families in uh, northern Italy, so we had uh, data from the co-op, from the banks, and from the telcos, and you could see that um, young families were not being served correctly in some districts. Right? But nobody was aware of it. I mean, people were just literally not aware of it. You had to actually look at the data from the young families to ask, well, why is this neighborhood so different than that one? And then the question gets asked, and, and uh, the answer gets percolated around. John? Oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. 
Um, Sandy, uh, Richard Thaler's also written about this a lot um, in, on this issue of you know, why would people upload their data into a brokerage like this or to you know, a trusted source. And he says that if, if this really took off, we'd have a whole new economy of organizations popping up, kind of like you know, or organizations where you could upload your own data to get insights. Like you know, a simple example would be you know, right now we get mobile phone bills and pieces of paper or PDF files. Well, if it's real data you could, that you could upload, that you could just say, well, it would be like a trip advisor for mobile phones. You, know, you don't want this plan, you want that plan. Or you could mash up your Apple Watch data with your supermarket, supermarket club card data with the amount of time you watch TV and you can get like, personalized health insights and things like this. So like, that, that would be the motivation, right? There'd be this whole new economy of services that would pop up if, if, this, if this sort yeah. of really existed. Yeah. So one of the things that you see in some other countries too is, is when you get uh, transportation services, small payments in sort of casual shops, a couple things like that going through one identity network, uh, that identity mechanism tends to spread really well. So Oyster Card is an example in Hong Kong, for instance. Um, so you can imagine stuff that are, are like that. I was just talking with uh, the head of Deloitte's mobility services, worldwide head of that, and, and he wants to make a, something that's a sort of a, uh, a trip advisor, but for local. So instead of talking to Uber, you say, how can I get there? And it like calculates not only cost but social cost and externalities, and you know it's like, huh, a real dashboard. And and you could see, for instance, even regulation that says cities require this, so that the impact of traffic and, and energy and pollution on the city is minimized, but still maintaining choice. Sandy, um, just want to check one thing. You could have your same data in multiple exchanges, right? It's not exclusive. Sure, why not? One question I have, uh, I know you can't, your own personal data isn't worth that much, but I mean, isn't there a, a play for advertise? You know, I'm going to opt in, you know, advertisers. I, sure, uh, yeah, I absolutely. I mean, I would think they would kill for that if I'm personally curating, you know, this, you know, give me some, uh, I'm going back to the question about the incentive. But I would imagine that you could create shopping clubs and stuff. If I am going to intentionally give you this personal information, you know, you give me some sort of preferred discount. You Is could have it? a uh, concierge service that has access to extremely uh, private information to make the best decisions possible, because you know that it's not going to go further than that. Right. Right. So it wouldn't be resold or, and it, right, and or used against you though. in some way. Yeah. So another example, though, that's really interesting is, let's imagine that this was common. I'm just going to pick banks, but let, let's take credit unions, just to you know, sort of say it. Well, there's about 100 million members of credit unions who are adults in the United States. Um, if you wanted to start a small company and you went to the credit union association and you said, gee, could you offer this to your members? Um, you could have a startup that suddenly had 100 million customers and history, right, so that it could begin making really intelligent uh, offers. So think about that sort of app store, as it were. So this would be, you know, uh, personal data stores, personal data brokers, as an app store that offers not just ads, but actually the choices of functionality, where they would vet the functionality they could offer huge populations, uh, it would represent the people in the sense that it vetted the thing, and you know that your data is not going elsewhere. So something like that would actually be a real challenge to Facebook, because you could duplicate Facebook, but you, it's your data still. Yeah. Um, I have a question about, um, I see the evolution of data collection to be more and more passive. So as we're migrating towards, you know, uh, public accessible security cameras that are connected that will know where I am all the time or Alexa that is in coffee shop that will know who I am, what I ordered, when I ordered. Uh, these aren't data that, these are data that are being uh, collected without my knowledge. How does this how is this going to evolve? What, how, is, how are you going to arrive to consent when I'm not even aware of uh, the data collection at that point? So there's different problems, right? So one, like the tools we've built, passively collect the data that 
for things that you interact with. So these are things you know, right, or have in the background on your phone. So you can solve a fair amount of this problem. If you talk about security cameras, that's a different issue because you're not even aware of it. What we did, and uh, so we, we pioneered wearable technology and, you know, face-mounted cameras and the guy that did that is one of the students and he's here. Um, what we had to do is think about how would you actually get informed consent for using your image. Well, if you know where the camera field of view is and you know where you were, you know if you're likely in that image. Now, you don't know that, but I can have a background process that says, here's the places I were, and uh, I, don't, I want you to delete that image for, for any place that you know, I don't like. And, and they would say, well, we have to keep it for security, for 24 hours for security purposes. Okay, maybe that's a, a reasonable bargain. That's the way a lot of security cameras are. But then you have to delete it. And because I know where I was and what the camera was, right, I can begin to enforce that. So you can, you can do some sort of virtual cone of silence things. It's not a complete solution, but it, it does a lot of the things. Actually getting people to do that is, of course, a big issue, and how are you going to do it? You know, um, you could probably do it in the UK because the cameras are sufficiently centralized there and sufficiently controlled that you could cut that deal with, with uh, government and people would have to do it. In this country, it's a little more Wild West, uh, but... Sure. Another interesting thing here is that these data cooperatives can have categories. So you can, based on the type of the data category that you have, the overall value of the cooperative will increase. So let's say if you convince the first member to be, let's say, the bank, they will put their data and then the next member may be a telco and then the transportation agency and then the health. They will all get access to the insights, but they maintain ownership of the data. But then the exponential value of that insights will increase, convincing additional data members to, to, to come on board. So uh, I don't know if you thought about that in terms of there could be different types of data cooperatives based on the type of data that you host there. Yeah. I mean, so, so all those are possible. You know, the, um, you know from, from the point of view of MIT, what we want to do is, is get this idea out there and provide the sort of basic uh, sort of pre-standards infrastructure and also some sort of a prototype to illustrate that it actually works. And then there's a whole range of business models that can be done. Right? And uh, so you know, we're, that's what we're up to, right? So uh, we have a supplier of, of software for credit unions coming. And he's agreed to like add some of our sort of special magic to all the credit unions without them knowing, because <laughs> yeah. because they just run his software, you know, it's whatever, and that'll give people more choice over data. That's sort of a first step, and I can imagine other sorts of people that would want to do that. Uh, and if you sort of publicize this idea, it solves a lot of the problems around privacy and and the data ecology because individual data is not worth that much. We've tried to do that for years. It just doesn't work very well. But cooperatives work pretty well, right? We've seen that historically, and you can imagine lots of types of things which you'd have these sort of bundled offerings of various sorts. So is it like Fidelity? Is it like, you know, Bank of America? Is it some sort of buyer's cooperative like the co-op in, uh, in Switzerland, I don't know. I don't really care. I think what what I mean. I'm happy to see all these things compete. I mean, right? this, this is the future of the bank graph. I mean, graphs are going away, but think about the future of the graph that you would use hyper local data cooperative of that community that the members of that community are driven that you give them deposits and checks. They're depositing their local data, and then the old members of that community will have access to the insights. So, I mean, let me just give you a simple example of a really high value thing. Let's imagine that you had cooperatives like that in Hong Kong, was it 15 years ago? One of those cooperatives would have seen that all the people in one of their big apartment complexes was stopping, weren't going to work anymore. 
uh, was the beginning of the explosive spread of SARS, right? They would have seen that within, I mean, that would have been really weird because one day people didn't go to work and that would like raise this big red flag. You don't really want the government watching everything all the time for that, but you could have a local data cooperative do it, right? Or you could, like for instance, the town of Newton uh, here, right? Turns out that they had unusual numbers of breast cancer, which was never really noticed, and it was because one of the people that cut lawns used a particular type of weed killer, right? Now, it took decades for the government to notice that, but a, but a Newton cooperative would have said, well, wait a second, what's going on? And could have done a little data science without exposing particular data and, and find that. And, you know, so if you talk to people about what their value is, those sorts of things dwarf money. You can just repeat the question a little bit. So, you don't even need that tone. Okay, You're I'm wired up. Enough? I'm loud enough. Okay. Uh, so, 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 so you wanted me to drill down on the security. So, so this is the so yeah. Um, it's uh, OWASP 2.0, uh, and it's primarily because it's the most popular thing out there, and we have the software. It's not the most secure. Uh, I got into trouble when OWASP was being developed. I said it's in the Internet Engineering Task Force. I was in upfront microphone. I said it's the most underspecified specification security that the ITF have seen. So we're stuck with it. Uh, we're actually using a version called OpenID Connect on top of that, which has all the all the features. But but um, uh, and that's similar to Mobile Connect, which is the, in the so carrier world, right? So the GSM, GSMA guys in Europe, Deutsche Telekom, is is forefront in trying to push Connect. But I think you guys got better solutions. I know Swisscom has better solutions. Okay, go ahead. NDA. <laughs> any, anyone else? Good. Any questions? Okay. So we can have a, a broader discussion, and we've been having a discussion. Um, I don't, we're probably a little tired you know, in the afternoon, stuff like that. Um, the, uh, the things that sort of I've heard that we're thinking about moving forward is, again, some of these pilots, like this sort of data cooperative idea, trying to do that with people. Um, the distributed learning, the federated learning, where you have guarantees that you don't leak data to other people. Um, another example of that is this sort of heterogeneous uh, data where, you know, not every uh, bank has exactly the same data, not every restaurant has this. How do you draw insights across these things? That's so those are sort of AI style problems. Um, the stuff that Yan was talking at the beginning where you can look at transactions and from that infer the influence network and infer the stratification is frankly rather revolutionary. It takes all the stuff you do for targeting, for fraud, for this, for that, for the other thing and brings it to a whole nother level. The difficulties with that technology at the moment is that it's sort of inefficient, but we have good ideas for how to actually make that rock and roll. Um, and it has to do with it making it a much more distributed algorithm, which would have the virtue of then giving you a lot more insight about people uh, and, uh, and their situation uh, as, uh, as a sort of side effect of that. So there's a bunch of technology things that we're doing. Pretty clearly, we're going to continue on with the inequality stuff. Esteban was talking about that. So it's, inequality is one way to cast it. Another way to cast it is we want to build models of how cities work, right? How do people work in cities? What's positive, what's negative? So with you in Beijing, we were able to derive um, conditions on mobility within Beijing that allowed us to count for half of the variance 
in uh, GDP growth. So that may sound a little sad about, right? But but the point is is that things like you know education and investment and so forth. I mean, you're in property stuff, right? Half of the variance, good, <laughs> very good. <laughs> you know, and we were then able to duplicate that in Istanbul and duplicate that in New York City, uh, using sort of similar types of, of of data sources. Once we sort of knew what we were doing, so so. This business of really understanding how cities work gives you the ability to build a genuinely smart city. Right? So the, the opposite of predicting where the GDP goes up is predicting where the crime goes up. And it turns out it can be predicted in very similar sort of ways. Um, you know, we've done that at sort of a macro scale using aggregated data, so neighborhood by neighborhood data. But the sort of things that Jan were talking about give the option of of becoming more fine-grained, perhaps, right? To understand more granular about what elements of a community are having problems, what elements are contributing most to the to the solution, and so forth. So the people, I mean, so that's sort of the the general uh, rock and roll. One of the parts of it, of course, is you heard about the uh, uh, the skills and jobs. So Morgan was talking about that. So he's a new member of the group. Um, although we've been collaborating and doing things together. And so that's an attempt to move from the sort of understanding how patterns of interaction give rise to results to understanding what is it about patterns of interaction? What sort of activities, skills, job types are the things that you need to uh, invest in to get the right sort of results? Right? And, and a lot of the work, as you've heard in the past, and this hasn't been very granular, which means it hides a lot of effects, or you fail to see things. So this sort of having more data on sort of more dimensions uh, gives you the ability to see the, the clockwork underneath it. A common problem with all of these things is trying to establish causality. Um, one of the main threads that we have is around understanding causality. Um, we don't do it the way other people do it. Uh, because we've observed that some of the things that people take as granted aren't true. <laughs> so for instance, in the, in the health industry, for instance, people use randomized controlled trials all the time, right? It's taken to be the gold standard. Turns out it's not a very good gold standard. If you look at real data sources, and particularly what you see is you see lots of things where you get cascades and they have long tails statistically, um, it because the standardized technology that people use to test A/B testing uh, gives false results maybe a third of the time or more. Right? It's like, oh my God! You mean all those billions of dollars are like that crappy in terms of their outcomes? Yes, that's true. And so we're trying to develop better statistical techniques for 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 dealing with some of these underlying problems that may not be visible, uh, but throw a lot of uh, sand in the gears, let's just say.